Hello and welcome to the Fish House Nation podcast. Joining us today is Dave Weitzel, Area Fisheries Supervisor in the Grand Rapids area from the Minnesota DNR. Dave, thanks for joining the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Dave, I wanted to have you on today to talk about panfish management, the topic that's becoming more and more popular, especially among ice anglers. Before we get into those regulations and proposals, first of all, can you just tell me about the life cycle of a sunfish or what a lot of us just call bluegills? Yeah, their biology is is really kind of interesting. Uh, and they do some, some different things that are maybe a little bit uh, unexpected, especially in the way that they react to, to predators, including humans as a predator. Uh, so basically their, their basic biology is they're a warm water fish uh, that in our part of the world will typically live up to about 10 years old. Uh, their growth rate is really dependent on the length of the growing season and the water temperature. So down in the southern United States, you can grow a large bluegill in, in maybe as little as three years uh, the challenge in uh, my part of uh, the country, up, up here in northern Minnesota, is that the growth rates are really slow. They only grow about an inch a year. Uh, so for us, that means it takes about eight years to grow one of those eight inch quality sized bluegill. Uh, and that's a long time. <clears throat> that's a long time for a fish to have to survive in nature, especially when you add uh, human predation on top of the predation pressure that's already out there. So basically these bluegill are, are gonna be really well suited for uh, most of the lakes and streams that we find throughout the upper Midwest. And by that, I mean, they're, they're gonna find good habitat. Uh, they're a pretty adaptable fish. They can live in a wide range of different habitat types and they're gonna reproduce really well on their own. That means uh, in most cases, stocking isn't really required to maintain good panfish uh, fisheries, particularly for bluegill. Uh, in some cases, one of the issues we see is they actually reproduce too well on their own. Uh, so we end up with these lakes that are overpopulated with small bluegill. And when you have a lot of small bluegill in a lake, it really affects our growth rate because each one of those fish is competing with the other fish that are around it. And you can actually end up with uh, lakes and streams that have stunted sunfish populations. And this is where harvest can make a really big uh, impact. Uh, because these fish are going to try to compensate for the biomass that's lost when anglers remove fish. So every lake has got what biologists call a carrying capacity. So basically a lake can support so many pounds of bluegill. Uh, it could support a heck of a lot of small bluegill or relatively few large bluegill. But either way, the total weight of all those fish is going to reach uh, this natural carrying capacity. What happens is anglers, we typically like to harvest the largest sunfish first. So we're removing the heaviest fish from the system and that creates a void. That population drops below carrying capacity and the population wants to, to fill that void as rapidly as possible. And the fastest way to do that, especially in a part of the world where growth rates are slow, is to have increased survival of young sunfish. So basically, uh, if we go out and we remove a bunch of these big uh, bluegill, uh, the lake's going to compensate by the next generation producing a large year class. And that's okay from time to time, but the problem is when we do this for decades on end, uh, before long we've got generation after generation of these small bluegills that have kind of taken over the lake and it's really affected their growth. And then the other thing that bluegill do, uh, you know, th their main goal in life is to reproduce. So if they're in a system where it's not likely that they're going to live very long, they're gonna reproduce at a younger age and a smaller size. Uh, if they're in a system where they are gonna live a long time, there's an advantage for, for growing large because the larger bluegill are gonna get the best spawning habitats and they're gonna attract the best mates. Um, you've probably seen bluegill spawning in, in maybe June in my part of the world. And what you'll find is they form these large colonies where there's maybe uh, anywhere from a dozen up to you know, maybe a hundred fish on a spawning site. And the largest bluegills, the, the, the largest males, tend to get those best spawning sites. Uh, so that kind of creates competition among these males and gives them a reason to grow large. Once we remove those large males, that competition is gone. Now these smaller males can have prime spawning habitat and they don't really have to compete anymore. Now the problem with this, once males start to spawn at a, at a smaller size and a younger age, 
they'll, they'll start to shift their energy. All that energy that was going into growth no, now goes into um, reproduction. Reproduction is a pretty vigorous activity. If you're a male, you have to defend a nest. If you're a female, you have to produce eggs, and that comes at, a, at an energy cost. So when we uh, determine the age of fish, we'll usually look at marks on uh, bones or on scales. It's pretty easy to determine when that fish spawned the first time because you'll see a big change in their growth trajectory. Um, so basically in the upper Midwest over uh, many, many decades, we've harvested out a lot of these bigger fish that's resulted in this recruitment response that's increased the population of small bluegill and it's given these smaller fish an opportunity to um, spawn at an earlier size or a smaller size and an earlier age. Uh, and that's what's kind of created this uh, angler discussion about more need for quality bluegill management. Yeah, that's a, that's a great description. You kind of went through my, almost my entire list of questions, Dave, that was pretty good. So we'll, we'll kind of get it going here. There are some big proposals about decreasing panfish limits on many Minnesota lakes. And you, you kind of went through some of it there, but, but why, why is the DNR looking at, at doing that on some of these lakes? Well, it, it really starts from several decades of angler concerns that have been expressed. Uh, you know, everybody had their, their favorite panfish lakes growing up. And, you know, maybe we remember some of these places where we used to be able to get eight, nine, 10 inch bluegill. Uh, and those fish are, are hard to find in some of these systems anymore. So there, there seems to be fewer lakes out there that, that still have the biological potential to consistently grow large bluegill. Uh, so the question has come up, what can we do to protect these populations so that we can have at least some places to go in the future and enjoy quality bluegill fishing? Um, so th these conversations started as really as early as the late 1980s. Uh, but at that time, the role of harvest was poorly understood. We maybe thought that it more had to do with um, managing predators, largemouth bass, or maybe northern pike uh, to optimize bluegill. But over time, we've really learned that it is this, this additional predation that humans cause that's having a big impact on the fish's biology. Uh, so that led to uh, us forming a panfish work group uh, citizens advisory committee back in 2015, just to kind of discuss panfish in general, you know, and this would include opportunities to discuss uh, black crappie uh, and yellow perch. Uh, and we asked the group, you know, given, given panfish in general, what's your number one concern? And the number one concern that consistently came up was the need for more focused management on uh, bluegill. So we really wanted to start by understanding what was the history of bluegill management. And we found some things that were pretty interesting. Uh, so I went back and, and looked at our bluegill regulations. They date all the way back to the 1920s in Minnesota. And I was surprised to learn that once upon a time, bluegill regulations were actually a lot more conservative than they are now. And that's kind of the opposite of what we find for almost any other species. Um, most species have become more restrictive over time. Uh, in the case of bluegills, if you go back to the 1930s during the Great Depression, the daily limit was restricted to 15 fish, and there was a long closed season. The state was actually split into a northern and southern zone, and the season was closed uh, throughout the entire winter, uh, even through early spring, uh, which I think is really interesting. Uh, if you fast forward to about the mid-1950s, that's when the limit was changed to, at that time, it was a 30 fish limit and we allowed year round harvest. Uh, so that seemed to kind of kick off this period of when uh, the harvest of the large fish started to have a biological impact. And we're actually able to see that over time in some different data sets um, that, you know, certainly it created expanded panfish opportunities, uh, but it seemed to have an impact on size quality. And that was with 1930s technology, you know, so some pretty basic uh, rods and reels, uh, you know, maybe you had a, a cork bobber and a, and a hook with a, uh, Folgers can uh, angle worms you dug out of the garden. Uh, when you fast forward that to today's technology, and, and I love to, to do the ice fishing and have some pretty te nice technology, uh, you know, I use those tungsten jigs and the, the two and three pound line, and it's pretty easy to target bluegill anymore. So I think that problem's been compounded over time, and anglers realize that as well. They like the technology. Uh, but uh, they're telling us more and more that they're concerned about too much harvest. So that led us to explore different regulation options. Yeah, I think that's probably the one thing that I see where, when people uh, uh, start kind of pushing back against this proposal is that the regulations are focused in that 
maybe one lake you're going to go to 10 and then another lake it's going to be a 20 and there's there's just different regulations people i i I want it to be one one rule across the whole state can you talk about kind of why why there's going to be different or why we're proposing different regulations just so that not every lake is managed the same way yeah and we we took a hard look at that and that was kind of our our first step was to consider a statewide regulation change um so we wanted to look at two different aspects of that. First, we wanted to look at the biology of it. Does it make sense across the board? And then second, we wanted to look at uh, the social aspects of that. Is it popular across the board? Uh, So I'll start with the biology first. When we looked at the biology, what we found is that uh, not all lakes have the biological potential to support large bluegill. Uh, even with human harvest out of the picture, there's going to be lakes that that tend to favor these stunted bluegill where that uh, that early spawning biology is an advantage to the fish. Uh, so to reduce the limit in those lakes is really taking away opportunities from people when there's no biological need to do it. Uh, in fact, I'd say somewhere around half the lakes in the state, uh, they don't have the growth potential to, to take large bluegill. There's absolutely no problem with harvesting a 20, uh, 20 fish uh, limit from those lakes. Uh, so it, it seemed like we'd be really eliminating a lot of opportunities where there wasn't going to be a big biological return if we went with a statewide approach. Uh, but uh, we still wanted to ask the public the question. So we, we partnered with the University of Minnesota and did a, a mail-in angler survey um, to try to find out what's the general consensus with our angling public. And basically the feedback that, that we got from anglers is that there was an interest in, in quality sunfish management. In fact, the majority of anglers said that uh, catching a large sunfish was slightly more important to them than harvesting sunfish. But they also felt that the statewide limit was about right and didn't have a lot of support for doing a statewide approach. Uh, but we also asked the question about individual lake management uh, on lakes where we thought there was the most uh, biological bang for the buck. And that's where we found the support. Um, So basically, it it seemed like if we're able to identify lakes with the highest biological potential and then pursue a regulation that's socially acceptable, uh, that's where we can make the biggest uh, improvement in bluegill management. And ultimately, that's the approach that that we developed. We had our biologists uh, go through 40 years of lake survey data uh, across the state to try to identify kind of the best of the best lakes that had biological potential. And now we're working through the process of getting uh, uh, social data on those individual lakes to see if uh, there's enough interest to move forward. Um, so there, there's some lakes that have been proposed that uh, have very strong support. Uh, those ones are kind of a no brainer. You've got the biological potential. Uh, there's uh, a lot of folks that are saying they'd like to see this lake with a special regulation. Those are ones that will probably move forward. Lakes that are more controversial, maybe there's the biological potential but not the public support. Hey, we're, we're going to drop those regulations um, because the ultimate role of a fisheries biologist isn't to necessarily produce uh, the, the maximum potential of the fishery. It's for, to produce the fishery that people enjoy the most. So in other words, we're not managing the lake to benefit the fish, we're managing the lake to benefit the people that utilize the fish. Uh, and that's why that social understanding is extremely important so that we get the right regulation on the right lakes. Yeah, let's talk about that social understanding. When I was young, uh, there was a lake that I used to read about. This was before the internet, kids. Um, we used to get magazines and we would read about these lakes. And there was this lake I used to read about that had giant, bluegills in them and that was something that was really interesting to me the person who kind of taught me how to fish was he was a meat guy uh, he loved to go and catch bluegills so we took this trip up to this lake and it was you know right around memorial day and we went up there and just absolutely crushed them uh four guys with us this was the late 80s uh, the limit was 50 fish and i remember going into the spawning bay and literally filling the live well of his boat solid with bluegills and it was you know I, i'm sure there were If there wasn't 200, it was really close. And that lake just produced some crazy fish. And I remember in college thinking about going up there and somebody said, there's no, there's no bluegills up there to catch. You don't want to go there. Things that had changed in really a pretty short time uh, because people were were doing that type of thing. And, and I also remember, you know, you got to keep the big ones and you threw the small ones back. But I think 
that attitude and people are starting to to see the light on this but i think what you said though is kind of getting people to, to see it this way how, how do we change people's ideas on what fish they should be keeping and what fish everybody's got a camera in their pocket now so you don't need to bring it back in the bucket for proof we can all take a picture um how do we change that that idea with people yeah and it's it, it the it, it it, there really is a need to do education and that's why you know again thank you for the opportunity to speak today these kind of programs that kind of address this biological concern are, are outstanding uh, and we've had uh, um, great success working with the media lately uh, through several different outlets to try to get this message out there uh, and just kind of have an open discussion with anglers every chance that we get you know we certainly don't want to guilt anybody from keeping some fish that that's not the point here but i think we want to make people aware that the choices that they make uh, when they harvest the fish has biological consequences and some choices have more consequences than others uh, but you're exactly right and, and when i learned to fish you know my story is the same as yours my grandpa would take me to a, a local uh, channel between two lakes in the spring uh, and we'd fill a five gallon bucket with as many large bluegill as we could legally harvest. And, and you know what grandpa said made sense, you know, let the little ones go, we'll keep the big ones, we'll let the little ones go and those little ones will grow up to be big ones. But we didn't understand the biology that when we do that, the little ones biologically can't grow up to be big ones if we, if we do that type of harvest for too long. Um, so I think that that's a big problem. There's a misconception and, and quite frankly, I think that's been an issue with some of our limits over the years. You know, hey, if the limit's 20, the DNR is saying it's biologically appropriate to keep 20 of the biggest bluegill that you catch. Uh, well, if you talk to a biologist, that, that probably shouldn't be our message. Uh, the message should be, hey, it's fine to, to keep a limit of, uh, of fish, but keep some smaller ones. Or, or maybe in some of these lakes that have exceptional quality, uh, keep enough for a meal, but uh, you know, maybe we need to reduce the limit a little bit so that we can have some nine and 10 inch bluegills to catch in the future. Yeah, what does it take to turn a lake around like that? Once something like that happens, the lake that I'm talking about where it's really been decimated, is it even possible to turn something like that around? It's a great question and we don't know yet. And that's why we're starting our, our focus on lakes that still have potential to grow large bluegill. Um, th there hasn't been a lot of success stories. Once they've changed their, their biological uh, strategy, there hasn't been a lot of great success stories to bring a lake back. Now, with that said, there's been, uh, I think Wisconsin is a little bit ahead of us on some of the research. They've been looking at this a little bit longer than we have. Uh, and they have some lakes that are starting to show some, some progress that didn't have great size quality. Uh, but you're talking about 20 year time period of regulation before they started to see these changes. Uh, so in lakes that, that have caught, gone down that biological path that uh, it's an advantage to stay small, um, maybe we can turn some of those around, but uh, you're going to be in it for the long haul. Whereas uh, if you've got a lake that's already producing big bluegill and you can't really predict what fishing pressure is going to be like in the future, probably makes some sense to protect that fishery now. Uh, with that said, we, we are hoping to kind of kick off a research project here in Minnesota within the next couple of years where we're going to target some of these uh, lakes that don't have good size quality and try some different things to see if maybe we can bring some of those lakes back as well. For sure. With this year being the year of COVID, more and more anglers hit the water this year, Dave, and it's, it's going to be a huge year on the ice. I think everybody knows that there's going to be a lot of ice anglers out and way more than probably what we've seen in the, in the past five years at least. Can we do something right now, even though we don't have those regulations with all these people hitting the ice? And, and again, like you said, we don't want to ruin someone's fun. We don't want to take away an opportunity for them to have a meal. But what can anglers do right now to be able to, to kind of help the situation as they get out on the ice this year? And they're going to have plenty of people, plenty of company with them. Yeah, and, and that's a great question. And, and it brings up a great point. Uh, you know, in, in reality, if we're all conscious about what we harvest, uh, there really is no need for these reduced bag limits. If we could just all agree uh, to, to only take a few fish, you know, and enough for a meal uh, and let those larger fish go, you know, my personal rule is I let bluegill over nine inches go um, because I, I really enjoy catching the big ones. Uh, if everybody would, would uh, just kind of agree to do that, then the problem solves itself and we don't even need the regulations. Uh, but having these conversations, thinking about how many do you really need for a meal, um, you know, it, 
one thing that's really tempting, and I'm as guilty of this as anybody, but we all find those lakes that, that have the hot bite uh, and the fish kind of set up on a location and they stay there. And it's really easy to go out to that same spot time after time after time and bring a meal of bluegill home. Um, but you can only do that for so long and you've depleted the resource. So personally, if, if I'm looking to harvest some, some bluegill, I, I might go to, uh, you know, Lake A where the bite's been really hot. I might keep a few fish uh, for a meal. But then the next time I want to harvest fish, you know, maybe I go to another lake where, uh, you know, maybe the size structure isn't, isn't quite as good and I don't feel guilty about keeping some fish. Or maybe it hasn't had as, as much fishing pressure uh, and try to spread that harvest out over a bigger, bigger area. Uh, and that's, and I know it's a little bit tougher, especially in this day and age, because of the way that uh, uh, word spreads. You know, we're, we're blessed with having excellent access to information. Uh, so we hear about these hot bites while they're still occurring, and it, it's really easy uh, to go out and, and pound a lake. Um, but especially on these smaller lakes, you know, I, I've seen lakes where just one winter's worth of harvest has had a, a big impact on size structure. So we just have to be a little bit careful of that, conscious of it, and um, you know, when we're fishing with, with family and friends, have those discussions. Awesome, Dave. There's something about uh, panfish or bluegill management that you haven't got a chance to talk about, I haven't asked you about, that you wanted to bring up? No, I, I think that covers most of the talking points that, that I was hoping we could go through. Um, but just to give folks a, a little bit of perspective, you know, again, in, in our part of the state, um, you know, the, the growth rate really is a, a major limiting factor for bluegill. So just to give you some perspective, when you catch that 10 inch bluegill, uh, you could have probably produced three trophy white tail buck deer in the amount of time it took to grow, grow that one 10 inch bluegill. Um, so they are a rare fish. Uh, you know, they're not a very renewable resource compared to those seven inch and, and even in some cases, eight inch bluegills. Uh, so I think there's a lot of value in letting those, those really large bluegill go. Yeah, I've got a, a friend, Troy, Troy Peterson, they call him Mr. Bluegill. And, and he said right now, it's harder to catch a 10 inch bluegill than a 50 inch musky. Yeah, they're, they're rare. They're out there. We're blessed, uh, especially in my part of the state. We, we have them, even, even a few 11 inchers. Uh, but they're rare. So, um, you know, I personally, and, and everybody values the fishery differently and, and that's okay. Um, but the way I value the fishery, when I catch that fish, I really enjoyed it. And I like to put it back knowing that somebody else might have the opportunity to enjoy that fish again. Very much so. Dave, if people want to learn more about what's going on with panfish regulations in Minnesota, where can they go to find out? Yeah, we set up a, a really great uh, web page. If you go to the Minnesota DNR website uh, and search for sunfish, it's going to direct you to our sunfish uh, web page. Uh, and you'll find all kinds of good information on there, some biological factoids, uh, detailed description about our regulation proposals. Uh, and we're still in our comment period for these individual uh, lake proposals. So there's a link to an online survey uh, and folks can go in and, and tell us what they think about this, uh, either in general or on a lake by lake basis. Uh, so far, we've heard from about 2,500 anglers, which is outstanding. Uh, we're, we're pretty happy with this online format and the amount of input we're getting. Uh, but the goal is to hear from as many people as possible, whether they're for it or against it. It's really important that we hear those opinions. So I certainly encourage people to go to the website and check us out. Perfect, Dave Weitzel, Minnesota DNR. Thanks so much for your time today and coming on and discussing this with us. It's, uh, I agree with you. It's a super, super important thing to talk about, especially among ice anglers, because I think we're the guys who, who really get into the pan fish probably more than the open water anglers. Yeah, we love them. No, I sure appreciate the opportunity. This is awesome.